Yeah. Okay. So um, after the Windows troubles, um, this is so this is, I guess, not related to anything programming language theory or whatever. Um, this is something that I've been working on for for a while, uh, on and off, and uh, which I think might be interesting and maybe even useful to the Haskell community. Um, the, the format of this will be that I will speak fairly briefly and then there will be some kind of interactive part, hopefully. Um, so yeah, but first a bit of history. Um, about two years ago, fairly, fairly exactly two years ago, around the, the time of ICFP at that point, um, but that's irrelevant. On IRC, where I tend to hang out in the Haskell channel, um, People were discussing because in this in in the Haskell channel there there's usually um, the channel is driven by people asking questions, beginner questions or advanced questions. And when you ask a question in a channel where well everyone submits messages, um, you often want to share code, and you do that using a paste bin. And uh, especially for you know beginner kinds of questions, um, people were suggesting that it might be useful to have a paste bin. Um, that had a little bit of text on top suggesting that you submit certain information that's useful to debugging your problem, like error messages. Um, and then, you know, I suggested that building the thing wouldn't be too hard. The question is, you know, who, who hosts it? Because, you know, administrative stuff. And then, well, uh, <laughs> then came the challenge, you know. Uh, so I said, sure. <laughs> and then I did some programming. Um, and then, like, Slightly more than two hours later, I had a prototype pastebin service, which had no styling, but it did work, you know? Um, so fast forward with a bit more programming. Um, we have something that has proper styling, you know, and you can press submit, and then you get a page which has a URL that you can share, and then you have text, you know, pastebin. So we were happy. Um, <laughs> But then, uh, and this is actually fairly recent, this is this spring, uh, people were talking about, you know, other languages have these kind of playgrounds, where a playground is a website where you can enter some code in, in the language in question and then press run, and then there's some output that comes out. Uh, Haskell.org actually has something like this. If you go to Haskell.org, there's a line where you can enter Haskell code, and you can click, you can press enter, I think, and that shows the output. But it's exactly one line. And one line is usually not enough to write a Haskell program because. Sure it is. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, if if that, can you can you put multiple imports in one line? Can you put multiple imports in one line? Semicolon. Okay, so okay, so then we can end this talk because it's unnecessary. <laughs> um, but but let's continue anyway, because you know. Um, and then people suggested, you, you know, it would be nice if it integrates, you know, with this, this paste thing. And then people said, sounds good. So, so I did some more programming. <laughs> um, and then, uh, you know, we had a, we had a paste bin. Uh, we have, we had, well, we also have a paste bin, but we also have playground. And actually, let me see if this works. No way. Okay. Um, this is not the keyboard layout that I was expecting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I have a link in the thing, so that's good. Uh, so sorry for the... Um... Oh, no. Oh, no! <laughs> there we go. Okay, I can click back. Okay, so this is the thing, you know? This is, this is light theme. There's also dark theme, but light theme works better in the presentation. Um, and you can press run, and it runs. You know, it works. Um, and there's actually, um, you can also show the core of this thing, and uh, that also works. There are a bunch of other websites where you can enter Haskell code and run it, but usually they don't allow you to, you know, um, select other GC versions or, or show some of the intermediate representations. And one of the things that I particularly want to share is that, you know, it doesn't seem to, fit on the screen, you see? So there's this, there's this bar and you can drag it. Wow. <laughs> okay, so, so, so much for, for bragging about my, my JavaScript skills. Um, right, so uh, yeah, I showed that. So it, it's written in Haskell because everything, you know, Haskell is the best language to do anything. So it's written in Haskell. Um, it's open source and uh, furthermore, it is written by me. Um, I am an ICFP goer, so that means that, you know, 
if people want stuff in this, you can talk to me and we can implement it. Um, there's also other websites, but they're hosted by random people and you can't necessarily get features in it. So this is, <laughs> this is, this is a pro, right? Um, uh, there is also, I didn't show it, but there's a, there's a save button and then you get, you get a link. So it's a kind of a built-in page bin. Um, I put a bunch of work in making the thing horizontally scalable. So that means that if someone decides to be nice and uh, host a server for me, um, we can run an additional worker process on that thing. And then this thing has more compute capacity. Um, so that, that works. Uh, it has a mobile version, which is, I mean, it's not impressive, but it does work. Uh, the editor works, the buttons, everything works. Uh, you can show some, uh, and there's, there's, well, the variety of things that I showed. So before, before getting to the end, let me at least fill a little bit, a few, a few more minutes talking about, um, you know, how this thing works. Uh, the, the, the players here are, uh, there's, there's a user indicated by, by you know, the browser. Um, there's, there's the server and there's a bunch of worker things. And the, the, the point being that the server and the workers are different machines, uh, or at least you can imagine them to be different machines. What happens is the, the browser tells the server, okay, I want to run this particular code. It's a very simple uh, API actually. And then the server selects a random worker that, it, uh, that still has room. Um, it tells the worker to run the code. The worker sends the output back and it sends the output back to the browser and then the browser displays it, you know, simple. Um, so then the browser might get sneaky and submit like many requests and then the server says no, um, which is to be expected. And then the browser maybe gets even more sneaky and says, okay, maybe I can ask the worker directly. And then the worker says, no, because you need to sign your messages. Uh, point being that the communication between the server and the workers is actually signed. I took some, some elliptic curve cryptography library and wrote like, what is it? 10 lines of code uh, to make this work. So they have, they have keys and they, they sign their messages to make sure that all the uh, rate limiting is done by the server and the workers can just, you know, handle requests. Um, yeah, so I, I said that. Um, let me also say something about containerization because this is something that, um, yeah, maybe? I don't know if you're going to mention it later, but what if the workers are doing, the workers are doing this work, what's to stop them from some bad actor from like, sending code that I will, I will get at this, yes. Um, so, <laughs> You see these boxes? <laughs> the boxes are, are, are what you're talking about. So um, this, you should imagine this diagram to be like below the worker, you know? Um, so a worker spins up a bunch of containers. And the, the idea is that um, it spins up one container for every core and machine that it has. And within this container, it will run the GHC process. Um, it gets code, it selects a container. Uh, then the container starts the GHC process. This does computation, it runs the thing. Uh, gets the output, um, the output gets communicated upwards, the container gets destroyed now, and a new container, fresh container gets created. Um, furthermore, these containers have, right, so let me just show the entire thing. These containers are completely locked down. That's the idea. It's not quite a virtual machine, but I use a combination of Linux namespaces and Linux C groups to lock it all down. <laughs> uh, this took many man hours. And the, the idea is that, uh, well, there's, there's one container based CPU core, a container accepts one job and after the job is done, the container gets destroyed. So even if you completely manage to mess up the container and break everything, the container is gone afterwards and the next user gets the first one. Um, you can use only one core. So this five limits, this five, five seconds time limit is a wall clock time limit, but you can only use one core. So it's also a CPU time limit. Uh, and there's a small memory limit or like, not so small because GHC. Um, <laughs> uh, there's no there's no networking and there's a, s a small virtual disk of I think 100 megabytes. So good luck like dosing my machine by filling 100 megabytes. Um, and there's this further situation where you know the server and the worker are different things and they can run on different machines. So um, if you do manage to compromise the worker, if, if the containerization somehow fails, if you have a vulnerability in all the software stack that this whole thing runs, the server's still fine. Um, so some people might get garbled results back or something, but the whole system is still running. We can kill the worker and everything's still fine. Um, I have a 
I mean, it does have a few lines of CSS, but almost styling this uh, admin dashboard where I have currently, as you can see, one worker, uh, which is unfortunately running on the same machine because I'm a poor PhD. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but you see that there's the, well, there's a public key, and I can add workers, and it's you know I can manage the thing. I can at least add or remove workers without actually SSHing into the machine. Um, so that was mostly for the the explanatory part, and now comes the interactive part, uh, because this is mostly like it exists. Um, it does the basic minimum of functionality, um, but I would expect that people might have ideas for how this uh, might be used. And one of the things that uh, might be, that this might be used as is something that, um, uh, that Gershom already uh, uh, talked to me about in the, in the break before this thing. And that is that the, um, the, 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 the one line code input thing on Haskell.org might be replaced by something that falls into this backend. I don't know. Um, it's an idea. Let me try to see if, Okay, so I was planning to do this, but then question is, can I set this thing to use a keyboard that is QRT? Um, can I set this keyboard to use QRT? Um, I mean, uh, American. Uh, uh, yeah, so that the, the Z is not next to the T because I find it very hard to type with this. Yes. Anyway, we can we can just have we can just have a, a, a jam session. It's fine. Um, I don't need to type as long as my memory works. So um, here are some of the ideas that I have. You know, uh, some also suggestions that I got from from other people. So I can display core, but as some people have argued or argued against actually um, earlier today, uh, it might be useful to suppress some of the information because it's very verbose. Um, uh, so you might want to add extra flags to the thing. Uh, this is something that wouldn't be very hard to implement. Uh, maybe code formatting. I'm not sure why someone would want that, but some people seem to like code formatting. Um, um, another suggestion that I got, is, which is interesting, is like a download of the Haskell file with a minimal cabal file, so that people who don't know actually how all the Haskell tooling works can um, compile the thing on their own machine. I'll get to you. Um, some other playgrounds have this kind of uh, weird situation where instead of evaluating, like compiling and running the file as a whole, um, they tend to use this kind of <laughs> batched REPL kind of situation where they evaluate chunks of the file in, um, in a REPL and then show like the results in parallel uh, next to the, the blocks that are executed. Um, this is obviously harder to implement, but it is, possible um, and I mean if people are interested we can maybe work towards an implementation um, I am not too keen on actually putting HLS uh, behind this because a screenshot that I got from someone is that HLS tends to use a bit of memory uh, mm -hmm. and I also observed that I'm on my machine except that my machine has a lot of memory and the server that I run this on doesn't <laughs> so uh, that's a thing and yeah, there's, there's some, some other ideas. The, the last one being a suggestion that I got from, uh, actually from a teacher of a functional programming course uh, at my university, because um, they said that they might be able to offer some, um, some hosting capability for this thing to some machines that, that we can run workers on, but those machines would also be used for other purposes. Um, and because the load on this stuff and the load on those machines from the other stuff is likely to be very non-uniform, um, they can take each other's idle time, but then they would know would need to know about each other's busy time in order to, to you know schedule and make sure to not step on each other's toes. Um, maybe the uh, ability to do that will be useful. Um, I don't know. So now, yeah, floor is yours. Suggestions, discussions. <laughs> 